Okay, so here's the situation. We have a problem, and we've, we've hung a string, right? And it went down like this, and then it went like that, all right? And we discovered where it settled physically. So we want to explain this mathematically and see what's going on with this problem. So this is a real life problem. It honestly is the problem you have to solve if you want to build a bridge, like a suspension bridge. This, among many problems, it's a very serious and important problem, and this is the simplest one of this type. All right? So we've got our, our, our shape here. This should be a straight line, maybe not quite as angled as that. All right? So now, the first, we've already drawn the diagram, and we've more or less visualized what's going on here, but the first step after the diagram is to give letters, is to, is to label things appropriately. And I do not expect you to be able to do this at this stage because it requires a lot of experience, but I'm going to do it for you, all right? We're going to just do that. So the simplest thing to do is to use the coordinates of the plane. And if you do that, it's also easiest to use the origin. My favorite number is zero, and it should be yours too. So we're going to make this point be 0, 0, all right? Now, there's another fixed point in this problem, and it's this point over here. And we don't know what its coordinates are, so we're just going to give them letters, A and B. But those letters are going to be fixed numbers in this problem, all right? And we want to solve it for all possible A's and B's. Now, the interesting thing, remember, is what happens when B is not 0. If B is equal to 0, we already have a clue that the point should be the center point. It should be exactly that x, the middle point, which I'm going to label in a second, is halfway in between. So now the variable point that I'm going to use is down here. I'm going to call this point x comma y. All right? So here's my setup. I've now given labels to all the things on the diagram so far, or most of the things on the diagram. All right, so now, what what else do I have to do? Well, I have to explain to you that this is a minimization problem. What happens actually physically is that the weight settles to the lowest point. That's the thing that has the lowest potential energy. So we're minimizing a function, and it's this curve here. The constraint is that we're restricted to this curve. So this is a constraint curve, and we want the lowest point of this curve. So now we need a little bit more uh, 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 language in order to describe what it is that we've got. And the constraint curve, we, we got it in a particular way. Namely, we strung some string from here to there. And what happens at all of these points is that the total length of the string is the same. All right, so one way of expressing the constraint is that the length of this string is constant. And so in order to figure out what the constraint is, what this curve is, I have to describe that analytically. And I'm going to do that by drawing in some helping lines, namely some right triangles to figure out what this length is and what the other length is. So this length is pretty easy if I draw a right triangle here because we go over x and we go down y. So this length is the square root of x squared plus y squared. All right, that's the Pythagorean theorem. Similarly, over here, I'm going to get another length, which is a little bit of a mess. It's the, it's the vertical, so let me just, I'm just going to label one half of it so that you see. So this horizontal distance is x. And this horizontal distance from this top point with this right angle over there, it starts at x and ends at a. All right, the, the rightmost point is a in the x coordinate. So the whole distance is a minus x. All right, so that's, that's this leg of this right triangle. And similarly, the vertical distance will be b minus y. And so the formula here, which is a little complicated for this length, is the square root of a minus x squared plus b minus y squared. All right, so here are the, 
the two formulas that are going to allow me to set up my problem now. So my goal is to set it up the way I did here, just with, just with formulas and not with diagrams and not with names. Okay, so here's, here's what I'd like to do. I claim that what's, what's constrained, if I'm along that curve, is that the total length is constant. So that's this statement here. The square root of x squared plus y squared plus this other square root, these are the two lengths of string. is equal to some number L, which is constant. And this, as I said, is what I'm calling my constraint. Yeah? Uh, so the question is, shouldn't it be B plus Y? Uh, uh, no, uh, and the reason is that Y is a negative number. It's below zero. So it's actually the sum, minus y is a, is a positive number. All right, so here's, here's the formula. And then we want to find the minimum of something. So what is it that we're finding the minimum of? Now, this is actually the hardest part of the problem, conceptually. I've tried to prepare it, but it's very hard to figure this out. We're finding the least what? It's y. We've just got a name for that. So we want to find the lowest y. Now, the reason why it seems a little weird is you might think of y as just being a variable. But really, y is a function. It's really y equals y of x is defined implicitly by the, by, the, by the constraint equation. All right, that's what that curve is. And notice the bottom point is exactly the place where the tangent line will be horizontal, which is just what we want. So we, from the diagram, bottom point is where y prime is equal to 0. So this is the critical point. Exactly. So I'm deriving for you, so the, the, the question is, could I have just tried to find y prime equals 0 to begin with? The answer is yes, absolutely, and in fact, I'm leading in that direction. I'm just showing you, uh, so, so I'm trying to make the following very subtle point, which is, when in maximum minimum problems, we always have to keep track of two things. Often the interesting point is the critical point. And that indeed turns out to be the case here. But we always have to check the ends. And so there are several ways of checking the ends. One is we did this physical problem. We can see that it's coming up here. We can see that it's coming up here. Therefore, this, the bottom must be at this, at this critical point. So that's OK. So that's one way of checking it. Another way of checking it is the, is the, is the reasoning that I just gave. But it's really the same reasoning. I'm pointing to this thing and I'm showing you that the bottom is somewhere in the middle, so therefore it is a place of horizontal tangency. That's the, that's the reasoning that I'm using. So again, this is to avoid having to evaluate a, a limit of an end or to use the second derivative test, which is a total catastrophe in this case. All right? OK. Now, there's one other thing that you might know about this if you've seen this geometric construction before with a, with a string and chalk, which is that this curve is an ellipse. It turns out this is a piece of an ellipse. It's a huge ellipse. These two points turn out to be the so-called foci of the ellipse. However, that geometric fact is totally useless for solving this problem. 
completely useless. If you actually write out the formulas for the ellipse, you'll discover that you have a much harder problem on your hands, and it will take you twice or ten times as long. So it's true that it's an ellipse, but it doesn't help. Okay, so what we're going to do instead is much simpler. We're going to leave this expression alone, and we're just going to differentiate implicitly. So again, we use implicit differentiation on the constraint equation. All right, so that's the equation which is directly above me there at the top. And I have to differentiate it with respect to x. So that's a little ugly, but we've done this a few times before. When you, when you differentiate a square root, you, the square root goes into the denominator. And there's a factor of a half, so there's a 2x which cancels. So I claim it's this. Now, because y depends on x, there's also a y, y prime here. So technically speaking, it's twice this with a half. 2 over 2 times that. All right, so that's the differentiation of the first piece of this guy. Now, I'm going to do the second one, and it's also the chain rule, but I'm just going to, you're just going to have to let me uh, uh, do it for you because it's just a little bit too long for you to uh, pay attention to. It turns out there's a minus sign that comes out because there's a minus x and a minus y there. And then the numerator, the denominator is the same massive square root. So it's a minus x squared, b minus y squared. And the numerator is um, a minus x, which is what replaces the x over here. And then another term, which is b minus y times y prime. I claim that that's analogous to what I did in the first term. And you'll just have to check this on your own, all right? Because I did it too fast for you to be able to check yourself. Now that's going to be equal to what on the right-hand side? What's the derivative of L with respect to x? It's zero. It's not changing in the problem. Although my, my uh, parachute stuff stretches, um, we tried to stretch it to its fullest extent so that we kept it fixed. That was the goal here. All right? So now, this looks like a total mess, but it's not. And let me show you why. It simplifies a great deal, and let me show you exactly how. So first of all, the whole point is we're looking for the place where y prime is 0. So that means that these terms go away. y prime is equal to 0. All right, so they're gone. And now what we have is the following equation. It's x divided by square root of x squared plus y squared is equal to, if I put it on the other side, it's the minus sign is changed to a plus sign, a minus x divided by this other massive object, a minus x squared plus b minus y squared. All right? So this is what it simplifies to. Now, again, that also might look complicated to you, but I claim that this is something, this is a kind of equilibrium equation that can be interpreted geometrically in a way that is very meaningful and, and important. So first of all, let me observe for you that this x is something on our picture, and this square root of x squared plus y squared is something on our picture. Namely, if I go over to the picture, here was x, and this was a right triangle, and this hypotenuse was square root of x squared plus y squared. So if I call this angle alpha, then this is the sine of alpha. All right? It's a right triangle. That's the opposite leg. So this guy is the sine of alpha. Similarly, the other side has an interpretation for the other right triangle. If this angle is beta, then the opposite side is a minus x, and the hypotenuse is what was in the denominator over there. So this side is sine of beta.
And so what this condition is telling us is that alpha is equal to beta, which is the hidden symmetry in the, in the, in the problem. I don't know if you can actually see it when I, when I show you these, 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 this thing, but no matter how I tilt it, actually the, the two angles from the horizontal are the same. All right? In the middle, it's kind of obvious that that should be the case. But on the sides, it's not obvious that that's what's happening. All right, now this has even, so that's a, that's a symmetry, if you like, of the situation. These two angles are equal, but there's something more to be said. If you do a force diagram for this, what you'll discover is that the tension on the two lines is the same, which means that when you build something which is hanging like this, it will involve the least stress. If you hang something very heavy and one side carries twice as much load as the other, then you have twice as much chance of its falling and breaking. If they, all, if they each hold the same strength, then you've distributed the load in a much more balanced way. So this is a kind of a balance condition, and it's very typical of minimization problems. And fortunately, there are nice solutions which distribute the weight reasonably well. And that's certainly the principle of suspension bridges.